And now, Lifestyles Unlimited presents the Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Over the next hour, we unfold your map to financial freedom. You'll learn how to retire through investing in single family and multifamily real estate. You'll learn how to create cash flow and build wealth so you can have the time and money to live the lifestyle you want. Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. I'm Mike Harrison, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. I want to thank you for joining me today. There are many aspects to being a real estate investor, and one of those is that we build a team to help us along the way. Team members help us become and remain successful. And another important point is that we leverage everything. We leverage other people's time. That's contractors, uh, GCs, realtors, for example. We leverage other people's knowledge. And for me, that's real estate educators. That's other lead investors. That's single family investors that I know. My mentors, other members. I just had lunch last week with another member. He's a business owner, really smart guy, fellow member, fellow passive and fellow aspiring lead. And we get together and share notes and with that uh, we just become a little better as a real estate investor we try to stay sharp um, every vendor i've used along the way i just had my uh, foundation worked on on one of my rental properties and i had gavin on the show a couple weeks back if you missed that from straight line foundation but most importantly we leverage maybe this might be the most important we leverage other people's money we use lenders we use bankers we literally put leverage on every single real estate asset that we own. And I will tell you right now, if you don't have the right product, the right lender, the right, essentially a good lender is also a mentor. They're going to guide you in the right direction. Well, without the right person there, let me just say it, it makes the path that much more difficult. And, and if nothing else, it's going to extend years to your timeline to success. So to discuss lending, I brought my friend who has also helped me along the way, Carrie Donham from Capital Concepts to the show. Carrie, welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. You've been a vendor of Lifestyles Unlimited for uh, a long time. As long as I've been a member, um, you've been a vendor. So you're you're before before my time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Capital Concepts? Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to uh, go into a little background on us, the key individuals, um, basically who we are, what we do and how we do it. And uh, and then also we'll, we'll tie in some of this just to bring some context to it uh, for, for the listeners out there with some scenarios on how we've helped people. One of the things that you mentioned was uh, mentoring, and that's exactly what we do. We, we consult with our clients, and uh, there's, there's a three-step process that we put them through, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But background on me, I've been buying and selling properties since 2002. I bought and sold over 50 of my own houses. Uh, Blake Yar Yarborough is the owner of this company, and, and Blake, uh, he's bought and sold over 500 houses, rather. And I think yeah. currently he owns, I don't know, maybe somewhere around 130. I can't keep up with him. I love it. And so he created the company in 98. I started buying houses in 02, and around 04, we started having conversations back and forth on what we were doing. And uh, we merged those two ideas together. And I think that unique blend of um, having that experience as a real estate investor and then almost 20 years now as a mortgage professional for myself yeah. uh, really helps us help the, the members there make smarter decisions on financing. Kerry, you hit the nail on the head. The fact that you guys are real estate investors first and lenders second you're essentially guiding us in a way that you yourself, a path that you yourself have taken and, and take uh, on a daily basis. Um, why don't you tell us about some of the products that Capital Concepts has? Yeah, sure. Um, so we own our own hard money lending company, so we can do the rehab loans for properties that are typically where you're buying them in a distressed situation and disrepair, buying them at a discount. They have repairs that need to be done to it. That's a prime candidate for hard money. Um, we, we also do private money. I've done that uh, over the years with, with my clients. Uh, we also lend on conventional. We are licensed uh, loan officers. And by the way, we're licensed in multiple states. Basically, we're going everywhere that you guys are going, Mike. 
We do bank bank portfolio loans, and then we yeah. also one of my favorite loan products that we'll get into a little bit later is a uh, DSCR. I, I want to talk a little bit about private money. Um, you and I obviously know it as real estate investors, but I will tell you, I had never really understood the concept of private money before I became a real estate investor, and and I had to use private money. When I got to, I, w- I was greater than my 10 conventional loans. So then I had to come to you and use private money to essentially continue buying houses. Why don't you just define what private money is and, and some of the advantages for maybe some of our new real estate investors? Sure. So private money, I mean, I, th- I think that term gets um, used in various ways. When I talk about private money, we're really talking about a private individual who maybe has a bank of cash, you know, sitting around, and he wants to put that uh, that cash to work, um, you know, in a quick turnaround time. Uh, we utilize that as a as basically as a hard money loan. Uh, in fact, I, I closed 17 new builds out in uh, Maybank, Texas, and I did all of those on on private money, and uh, you know, we gave the builder 100% financing on that, and uh, it was really a, a win win. I mean, it was a low LTV somewhere around 64 or 65% LTV. So everybody, um, you know, felt really good about that transaction and everybody's protected, low risk for the lender, um, you know, et cetera. So that's really, when I say private funds, I mean a private individual yep. who's lending and becoming a lender. Kerry, I think somebody looking from the outside, and, and again, I, I, we all get here, but People just, all they know is conventional mortgage. That's all they know. I mean, they own the marketing, they own the airtime, they own the billboards. Uh, People think, okay, buy home, get conventional mortgage, and you hit on, no, there's a strategy to what we're doing. Are you going to buy the house for, are you going to hold it for three years, five years, seven years? Um, What is your plan? So go through some of these various strategies and then maybe how a different loan would suit somebody in that situation. So since you mentioned conventional, let's start with that. That's the traditional financing. Everybody knows this. It's the same financing that you put on your primary residence when you go buy a house. Um, we also, just so you know, because we're licensed mortgage professionals, we can do FHA, VA, uh, conventional. We can do primary residence transactions. We just focus our marketing around real estate investors. But conventional for, for real estate investors is uh, typically it's 20% down. You just put your down payment plus closing cost, and that's a house that is rent ready or maybe already has a tenant in it. There are a lot of instances where a lifestyle member is moving up into multifamily and they sell their single family and they sell their single family to another member. Yeah. Well, if it doesn't need a lot of work, there's no reason to, to use a rehab loan, which is hard money. But let's let's look at a scenario so that we can tie this in for somebody listening. Let's say you're buying something for a hundred thousand, you're gonna put fifty thousand into it in repairs, and it's going to be worth two hundred thousand. Now that is a prime candidate for hard money. The reason I say that is you're buying it at a discount, you have repairs wrapped up. Uh, that we can wrap up into the loan where conventional you can't. So let's just look at it on conventional in terms of cash outlay. 20% down, 50,000 uh, 50, um, out of pocket for repairs. So you have 20,000, which is your 20% of 100, right. plus your 50, that's 70,000 out of pocket. And yes. then add your closing cost on there, and let's say, I don't know, 74 or so. Um, if you have, you know, eighty, ninety thousand, even a hundred sitting around and you want to buy a house, well you wouldn't want to put all of that money into one transaction. But if we do this on hard money, hard money is based off of the after repaired value, not the purchase price like conventional. Yeah. So I'm gonna lend you up to seventy five percent of that after repaired value. Well seventy five percent and then if you take your purchase price plus your rehab dollars, add that together, that's your hard cost. That happens to be 150 in this scenario. I just gave you 100% financing. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and I think that throws people off. They don't understand hard money. You're loaning on an asset. You're saying, okay, here's an asset, and if you do X, Y, and Z, it will be worth 200,000. So that's loan on the value of the asset. Whereas conventional, mm-hmm. really, that's loaning on the individual. At least this is how. Tell me if I'm off base, but I look at it. So what's your credit rating? What's your score? Can I trust you to borrow the money? 
Whereas you cut all that noise out when you're doing a hard money loan. You're, you're, you're looking at the asset. Where's this property? Um, what's it, what's it going to rent for? Uh, the whole nine yards. It, am I, Am I hitting the nail there, or what do you think, Kerry? Yeah, so conventional, we have to calculate a debt-to-income ratio for you, and we have to maintain under a 50% DTI right now uh, with current guidelines. And so we have to look at your income documentation, your tax returns, W-2s, pay stubs, K-1s, all yeah. of that information that you submit to the IRS to file your tax returns. We have to look at that, and then we have to compare that to your debts. And so if you take your debts, divide that by your income, that's your DTI calculation. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's a quick overview. But when it comes to hard money, we are going to pull credit because we really need to see that the member is right. able to get out of their hard money and into their you know, conventional financing or DSCR or whatever the, the long-term product is we're going to use. But everything else – on the hard money is based on the asset. I don't need tax returns, pay stubs, or anything like that. I just need to know you have a decent credit score and you have the money to do the transaction. But more importantly, you also need to have a cushion for cost overrun left over, and you need to have the reserve funds left over for your refinance transaction. So we're looking at all of that for you guys to make sure that you, when you go into a hard money loan, we can get you out of it. Yeah, and it's refreshing to hear a lender say, hey, I'm putting you in this loan, in a hard money loan, uh, just so everyone knows, is going to be at a higher interest rate. Uh, So you want to be in it for a short amount of time. If you're paying that, and it's that interest rate, it's carry, what is it, three, two or three times what everyday rates are today, or where are they hitting right about now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, your short-term money is is always going to be a lot more expensive, but, but it's a tool, again, Seventy thousand out of, or seventy four thousand out of pocket in that hypothetical scenario we talked about, or seven or eight thousand for closing costs u- utilizing hard money. That's the only reason you would pay a higher interest rate. You would pay higher points and fees for the hard money because it's a tool to minimize your cash outlay. And by minimizing your cash outlay, you increase your cash on cash return. Right. And then the timeline, just so everyone understands, I always like to go into my hard money loans and come out of them right around that 90 day, that three months. So that gives us time to rehab the house and then get it appraised and then go into the conventional. We'll continue this on the other side. My name's Mike Harrison. Got questions? Call Lifestyles Unlimited at 855-497-4335. The Real Estate Investor Radio Show continues next. There is a dream killer here somewhere today. You're going to run into somebody that's going to tell you this stuff doesn't work. Like Vinette said, it's a scam. This is probably a multi-level marketing program. Somebody is going to tell you it doesn't work because you're the wrong race, the wrong age, the wrong sex, the wrong sexual preference, the something or other, that this is all set up so rich people can be successful and all you poor people can't. And if you believe that, they've won. But if you don't, you win. Don't believe the dream killers. Start winning today with the Lifestyles Unlimited free workshop. Get the knowledge you need to replace your income in two to five years, and then find out how to take action. Register for the free online workshop at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Creating the lifestyle you've always wanted. You're hearing Lifestyles Unlimited's Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm Mike Harrison. If you have any questions or comments, please send me an email. Ask Mike at L-U-I-N-C dot com. Ask Mike at L-U-I-N-C dot com. And while I have you, to you listeners out there, I'd like to send you a little challenge here. If there's a topic in real estate investing you'd like me to discuss or cover on the show, Send me an email, askmike at L-U-I-N-C dot com, and in the subject line, put show topic. So I know that this is an email specific and there's something that you'd like us to discuss or review on this show. I've got my friend, long-term Lifestyles Unlimited vendor, 
uh, premier sponsor for our expo that we do annually, Kerry Donham of Capital Concepts. And Kerry's so much more than a lender. He lives, eats, breathes, and sleeps this stuff. So no one better to have by your side as you're looking at various loans to put leverage on the real estate. And we put leverage on it because literally our returns are that much greater. If you missed that last segment where Kerry described essentially 100% loan 100 percent leverage on a real estate property it's fantastic so carrie there was another one that you hit on and i want you to explain it because i don't think a lot of people know but when would a what's a bank portfolio loan and when would that make sense okay so one of the things that we do and we try to take um, our clients and members of lifestyles with conventional financing because really it is the best terms out there in the market right now um at least for now um we, uh, we're going to take them as far as they can, meaning that conventional puts a limit to the number of finance properties that you can have as a real estate investor and still be able to obtain conventional financing, and that's 10 finance properties. Well, at that point, either if you don't qualify for conventional or you've capped out on your 10 finance properties, you have to look for alternative financing. Yes. One of the products that we used for many years uh, was a bank portfolio uh, loan. Now, when I say portfolio, that term, again, is uh, is used in various ways. But what I mean by that is the bank is going to hold that particular loan in their portfolio. They're not selling it on the secondary market. Whenever a conventional loan is, is originated uh, by mortgage company, that is packaged up. It's sold to Fannie and yes. Freddie, which is the secondary markets. Well, the bank portfolios don't do that. They usually hold those in their in their portfolio. And so it's a make sense loan. Um, we use this for, for individuals back in the day where they capped out on Fannie Mae. Uh, they would come to us and we'd take them to, to the bank. And a lot of banks would put, um, you know, they would have limits. Say, well, we're only going to lend a million and a half to any one investor or we're only going to lend – you know, three million to any one investor. It just really depends on the strength of the bank and their risk for that particular loan product. But the thing about the bank portfolio loans were and are, in fact, still, is that they're typically a commercial note, like a five-year note with a 20-year amortization. You'll find a bank every once in a while, uh, needle in the haystack, where they'll do a 25-year amortization. I had one bank over 20 years that would do a 30-year AM, and they pulled back during COVID and quit doing mm. originations for investors, and they still haven't brought that back. They might come back in, you know, after, um, you know, th- this recession that we're moving into and, and reopen the, the lines there, but for now they don't. Well, it's hard to cash flow on a bank portfolio loan on a 20-year AM, especially in this rising rate environment. Right. So – you know, we, we've just got a much better product, and it really, it's my favorite product, which is the DSCR, if you want me to go ahead and go into that one. Uh, yeah, if you would, what is that? Okay. What, what it stands for is debt service coverage ratio, and it's just another way to calculate your cash flow on a property. It's what banks use. It's what larger mortgage companies use on the in the commercial um, mortgage arena, and so the easy way to to put this is you just take your gross rents, you divide that by your principal interest taxes and insurance and HOA if applicable, and uh, that gives you your DSCR ratio. So for easy math, let's say you're bringing in 1,500 in rents, your PITI is 1,000, that's a 1.5 DSCR ratio. Right now I go down to one, which is basically a break even, no cash flow, on one of my products, 1.0. Uh, my main product that I'm using currently requires a 1.1, and I get better pricing with that particular product. But here's what I love about DSCR. No tax returns, no income docs whatsoever. It's an asset-based loan similar to hard money. They do a little more stringent and underwriting than hard money, but still, we're not asking you guys for tax returns, pay stubs, income docs of any sort. It's going to be done based on your credit score as a borrower, yeah, uh, the loan amount, the LTV, and the debt service coverage ratio. So you're you're essentially loaning on the cash flow of the properties. So let's say someone came to you and and do you grab five properties or something like that and and then do it and and then the DSCR loan is into those five properties for an example or what's it look like? I mean, it can. We do a lot of individuals for indiv- – Let's say um, you know you're still buying your hard money and then you need to refinance out of that, but 
you've already capped out on your Fannie Mae loan, then we yeah. would just do an individual DSCR. I've got a gentleman, lifestyle member, in fact, uh, he's he likes to buy up in the Sherman Denison area, and we're on transaction number 74 or 75 with him. I just closed nine hard money loans for him last year, and we're refinancing those out one at a time, but there's no limit to the number of properties. So as long as you have cash and you have yeah. decent credit, you can continue buying. So you can do it on a single property is what you're saying. You don't have to do a, a mm-hmm. group of properties all at once, but That's you can correct. do it like that if you want it. That is correct. Either or. So does the property have to be established in cash flowing, or can you look at it and say, based on the information we have, this property should rent for 1500 and then the mortgage, the PITI will be 1000 Can you look into the future and see it and then loan on that, or um, does it have to be yes. established already? Just, just like conventional allows you for a certain rental credit, when yeah. you're buying a property that doesn't have a tenant in it. So if it's a purchase transaction, we can use the rental comps that come in on the 1007 that the appraiser fills out when they do the appraisal report. And if they say, hey, I think this house is going to rent for $2,000, we will base the DSCR ratio on those rental comps. So the answer is yes, we can. Typically, when we're refinancing out into your long-term financing, say out of a hard money loan, well, then you know, we, we, we're typically utilizing a lease that's already in place, and so yeah. we'll utilize either the, the lesser of the, the rent comps or, or the actual lease agreement. Kerry, we've got a few minutes left. Um, what is this thing, this Biden rule thing or this mortgage change? Is this really happening? Explain what it is. And um, I think they said it takes place uh, May 1st. Correct me if I'm wrong there. That, that is correct, and it's called a loan-level pricing adjustment. And what they've done, and this makes absolutely zero sense to me, um, they are going to charge – they have a bigger hit for perfect credit. So if you have excellent credit, you're not getting an incentive. They're decentivizing you, and, and they're incentivizing – uh, those people with less than perfect credit, like a 620, 630 credit score, and giving them a discount. So it's in the interest rate? You're saying that somebody with good credit will now have to pay a higher interest rate, or is it a fee, or what is it? Yeah, it's it, it's it, loan-level pricing adjustment just hits the rate. So, yes, it's it's a difference in rate. Basically, the good credit people are going to be funding the less than perfect credit. It makes no sense. I, I don't understand what they were thinking when they put this in place. How can they just do this? Why isn't there a vote or anything like that? They and The banks will go That's along with it. Are they forced to go along with it? Yeah, it's, it comes from it comes from the government. Yeah, and they control the G. It's their GSEs, their government sponsored entities, Fannie and Freddie. Huh. Let's think this out long term. So somebody with eight thirty credit um, will pay higher than somebody who's in the six hundreds. Does, mm-hmm. I mean, how does this play? Does this encourage somebody to start slow paying a couple of credit cards before they go buy a house? It makes I mean, you wonder, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. I know I wouldn't do that, and I definitely would not recommend that to the audience. No. Of course, keep your credit good because it affects you in other ways, you know, interest rate on credit cards, et cetera. But um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be watching this closely and see how this pay, plays out. I'm not sure to the degree you know, what degree it will, will affect the good credit borrowers. And I won't know until I, I'm able to price a loan out on May 1st. So if you guys are already pre-approved with me and you want to take a look at that um, after, you know, say the 1st of May, I'd be happy to go over that with you guys and see what impact it has. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Um, with every with everything like this, anytime the government gets involved, it creates opportunity for real estate investors. So here's what's going to happen. They're going to encourage people with bad credit – To do what? To go buy a house again, and it's Mm -hmm. the same song, different decade, and what's going to happen is those people, if they've got bad credit, that's who they are. Now, don't get me wrong. Occasionally, things happen to people. uh, Bad things happen to good people, but um, they're going to get a bunch of people that probably normally wouldn't qualify or couldn't qualify, and they're going to put them into loans, and then we're just going to play the record for two years, three years, four years, and then you're going to start seeing the defaults. That's that's at least how I see it. Carrie, you see it differently? 
No, you you nailed it, and uh, and I think they're and, and it's going to hinder the real estate market to a certain degree. I think uh, you know for good credit borrowers because uh, you know as a real estate investor you have to look at the transaction and see well does it make sense is it cash flowing and obviously a higher rate is going to affect the cash flow on the property. Will private banks have to follow this? Uh, no, in anybody lending their own money or not selling to the secondary market, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, yeah. they, they can, you know, they can set it at whatever they need to. Their loans are based on the short-term rates, not not the long-term rates that we're talking about. Yeah, this may actually push more money to private lenders. I mean, just thinking out loud. I mean, you're the expert here, and uh, you understand this stuff on 16 levels greater than 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 I ever will. Um, you know, it's just crazy how these things uh, come about. But there's always going to be opportunity in it. So, Carrie. Where do you see, do you see interest rates tapering or or what are your thoughts on that? I'll say this. I mean, I I think they're probably going to continue to go up to a small degree. I don't think it's going to be, it's not going to be drastic like it was, you know, last year. They had the most increase last year than they've they've had in quite some time. Um, But I think in, let's say, 18 to 24 months, we'll probably have a refinance opportunity. So, don't I, I don't want people sitting on the sideline. Still buy no. your real estate. You know, if the deal makes sense, go ahead and buy it. You can refinance that later on if you're going to keep that property long term. Maybe even pull some cash out three years down the road when rates are are down. But but still buy your properties. Heck yeah! If you're cash flowing on, you do the math and you're cash flowing on that property. It makes total sense, even with this new Biden penalty that they're punishing the good people, the people that did what they were supposed to do and did their homework and uh, sacrificed and, and got ahead. But if the property still cash flows, the asset still makes sense to keep investing. Well, Carrie, I really appreciate your time. Uh, as always, um, we'll see you at the next case study. For the rest of you listening out there, I want you to remember, it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. Make it a great day. The information and opinions you hear on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.